I wanna take us to the text, the scripture we're gonna look at together in the few moments we have. It's Luke chapter 24, it's gonna be on this TV, you can follow along with me. Um, the Bible says in verse one of Luke 24, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. This would be the appearance of the angels. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. It's good news, right? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified on the third day, be raised again. And when they remembered his words, they came back from the tomb and they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. Maybe you're thinking this is a typo, there were 12, but actually by this time, if you know the story, Judas had already taken his life. And so there were only 11 disciples at the time. And then there were others that were followers of Jesus with them. And it was Mary Magdalene. They're describing the women that went to the tomb, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the apostles or the disciples. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense to them. This should give you a little insight that they did not expect a resurrection. Peter, however, Peter's my favorite. He's a little, a little fly off the handle guy. He carries a knife. He's, I like him. You're like, how do you know it? Read the gospels, it's in there. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Will you pray with me? Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds. We wanna hear from you. We haven't come to just do some Easter exercise. We pray you'd speak to us and may our lives never be the same. I pray for every person in every room, those in the overflow. God, you see them, you know them. And I pray that you'd speak to every heart. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said a big amen. Amen. Hey, by show of hands, every campus, everybody participating, even in the overflows online. How many of you ever had a day that didn't go as planned? How many of you are in the middle of that day right now? No, I'm kidding. So you're like, it's only 9.30. I'm already feeling that way this morning. Um, I, I, we, I've, we've all had those days. I believe that there's some um, conspiracy that happens whenever you have somewhere to be and you need to be there on time, that, that these slow drivers are deployed into the earth. Come on, <laughs> have you even know that? Um, people back up the lines at Starbucks with orders. Come on, you order the same coffee. Why'd you change it today? Why are you trying to change up your order? M McDonald's has been serving cheeseburgers since the early 1900s. Why are you staring at the menu like it's new? <laughs> Can I get a better amen in the house of God today? My, my son, my oldest, he had a day that didn't go as planned the other day. We all went shopping together, all of us. If you don't know, we have four children, 15, 12, five, and three. This yes, there's a bit of a break. There's six of us. And um, so we all went shopping. And uh, actually what it means is Tammy wanted an outfit and the rest of us came along for the journey. <laughs> and um, not to throw you under the bus, that's just what happened. And uh, so Faith went with her on the shopping journey, which myself, my oldest, Owen is 15. And the two, we call them the littles and the bigs. The two littles went with us. And uh, we were shopping, it was an outdoor area. There's kind of a play area. The, the play area lasted about 20 minutes. Then we went and looked for tennis shoes because they, they needed some new shoes. And uh, if the kids want good shoes, they go with dad because I'm a shoe guy. And, um, and so they came with me and we got good shoes. And uh, then we got a pretzel, come on, trying to give them a snack because they were hungry. Then we went back to the playground and we'd used up about an hour of what became a three hour shopping experience. <laughs> And, uh, and about two hours in, Owen goes, can I text mom and find out why this is taking so long? It's one dress. <laughs> I was like, welcome to your life, bud. <laughs> this is gonna be a long journey for you. But we've all had days that didn't go as planned, right? And I would propose to you today that Easter Sunday, that Easter morning, resurrection morning, although that we think of of all the, the wonderful experience of joy and celebration. And come on, how about our worship teams, every campus? What an incredible start to the service. 
And we think about the outfits we picked out and we just think about the pictures we're taking and, and the fondness and the joy of what Easter is, but Easter Sunday was not that at first. And I think to really get the picture, we need to back up a little bit to Friday and maybe even a little bit more to Palm Sunday. You know, on Palm Sunday, Jesus is making what is called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and they're laying palm branches down is where we get the name. And and then the rest of the week, he's having the Last Supper and and the beautiful artwork that's been created around that whole night. And, And, but then we get to Friday and Friday is anything but joyous. Friday is the day that he is beaten and a crown of thorns is put into his head. And if you don't understand crucifixion, Romans were experts at it and, and they, would, they would beat the, the prisoner with what's called a cat of nine tails. If you're unfamiliar, it's a whip that has nine leather strips and it has stone and it has bone embedded in it. And it's not like just they would smack them with it. They would wrap it around the body and then pull it so as to rip the flesh. I'm not trying to you know, get of a downer on your Easter, but I'm trying to help you understand what they saw. They saw their Lord, their friend, the one they had had meals with, they broke bread with, they learned stories from, they were amazed at the revelation that he would give them. The, they watched him open blinded eyes and they watched him feed 5,000 with a few loaves and a few fish. And, and they watched him raise Lazarus from the dead when he'd been dead for four days. They had seen miracle upon miracle and signs and wonders. And they thought it was gonna become something and now it wasn't and he's dead. And so Easter Sunday morning, they go to take spices and they didn't expect a resurrection. They thought it was over. And I just think that they walked up on the grave and the grave represented a couple of things that it represents in our life today that we can relate with these women, whether we are skeptics of faith or whether we have been walking with Jesus a very long time. And I think first that the the grave that they walked up on that day represented loss. And I think all of us in our life have stood over the grave of loss at some point or another, have we not? I mean, the past few years have represented a whole lot of loss. Some of you, you lost family, you lost people, literally loss in your life. And the grief of that still sticks with you. Some of you, you in your life at some point, you lost innocence. And whether it was your choice or the choice of somebody else, we've all been through loss, have we not? The loss of security is what I think this last few years brought. Pre-pandemic, how many of you ever thought that in a moment your health could be turned upside down, the world could be turned upside down, that, that everything could change in the snap of a finger and all of a sudden the world felt like it was shifting underneath you and this, it felt like it went from a solid foundation to a sandy one and some of you are still reeling from that and the loss of financial security and the loss of physical security and all of us have gone through loss no matter how much money we have or we don't have, no matter what status we have in life or we feel like we don't have, we have all experienced loss, the loss of a marriage, the loss of a career, the loss of finances, maybe the loss of a child, walking away, no relationship, disconnected. We've all in our life, no matter who we are, we're not exempt because we're in this thing of humanity from loss. But I think the grave also represented failure. See, the Jews thought that Messiah would come and that he would overthrow Roman oppression, which is what they were under. He would establish a throne and a kingdom on the earth and then they would be in charge and they would rule. And all that was gone, all the hopes of whatever this would become, this movement that thousands of people were following him and and this thing was really gaining momentum at this point and his notoriety was really picking up and, and people were following him from all over the place. So much so that he said, listen, I've come to die and Peter goes, no, no, we won't let you do that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Like they had other things in mind and now it represents failure. And I know that we've all been over the grave of failure, have we not? Whether it's choices we've made or life that has happened to us, we've all been through failure in our life. And here's what I know about all of us, whether we have faith or feel like we have no faith, is that whenever failure hits, we go into a what if mode. Well, what if that hadn't have happened? What if I hadn't have went to that party and met that person? What if... I hadn't have said that. What if I hadn't have lashed out in anger? What if, 
What if I hadn't responded that way? What if I hadn't have lost the job and lost the income that created the mess? What if I had have listened to my spouse when they were trying to tell me they were unhappy? We end up in the what ifs, and I know that we also end up in the if onlys. If only they hadn't have walked out on me. If only I hadn't have failed again at that Thing, if only, and we go through all these things, and here's what I know about all of us, no matter where we find ourselves today, is that whenever failure and loss enter our life, it brings pain. It brings deep pain. And some of you, as I'm talking, you feel the pain of those losses and failures begin to rise up. You're thinking, I wish I'd have went to a more encouraging Easter message. <laughs> We're going to get there. But here's what I know is that whenever there is pain in our life, whenever there's pain in any of our lives, we try to get away from it. Now, most of us with like, you know, intelligent working <laughs> apparatus up here in our skull, when pain happens in our life, we're like, how do I get away from that pain? Are y'all following me? Or y'all, y'all do try to get away from pain, right? We try to get away from pain. And whenever pain is happening in our life, we try to get away from it or we try to cover it up. And we're just like the women that came to the tomb that day because one thing you've got to understand is that the text said they came to the tomb very early in the morning and they came with spices. What's important to understand that the Jewish people did not embalm bodies when they died. They allowed them to decay naturally. And so a body would decay. And so like we think today that bodies are embalmed and then they're put into the ground and they're forever in that spot. Well, in this day, bodies would decay. They would remove the bones and they would reuse the tomb. That's why you would have family tombs. Jesus was buried in the family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And he was willing to give him that tomb because he knew at some point his body would die. They would remove the bones. And then that was the thought. Are y'all with me this morning? And so the women brought spices because the spices were put on the body to help the decaying process not smell so bad and not stink so bad. Are y'all following me? And I don't know what spices and, and other texts tell us that perfumes were brought. I don't know if they brought a little potpourri, a little cinnamon. Oh, that makes me think of Christmas. Wrong holiday. I don't know if they brought a, a little bit of perfume, perfume, you know, and sprayed over. So they didn't have the little con spray contraption. You know what I mean? They would just break it. They did have perfume though, because someone broke a, a bottle of perfume and put it on the feet of Jesus. I don't know what kind of spices that they brought that day to cover up the stench of the de decomposing body, but I know that was the purpose of it. And I think we are just like that. That whenever things die in our life because we're unsure of how to deal with it, then we just try to cover it up. And we think if I can just cover up the stench of the decaying things in my life, then everything will be better because you and I have no solution for these things often. We can't make dead things come back to life. So we just think if I can just make it smell a little better. And so we live our lives over the death of loss and over the death of failure and the pain that comes with it. And we just think if I can sprinkle a little spice on it and I can just spray a little perfume on it, maybe I'll make it smell a little better. And so the relationship falls apart and the relationship decays and it begins to die and we just think, well, I'll, I'll just grab another relationship and maybe that'll cover up the death of the stench of the last relationship that didn't work out. And, and then we think, well if, I can just, well, if I can just make a little more money and if I can just have a bigger house and a nicer car and live in that neighborhood and, and join that community, then maybe that'll cover up the, the, the deep longing I have for fulfillment that the raise didn't give me and the income didn't give me. And it doesn't matter how many zeros end up on the end of the check. It doesn't seem to fix the problem in my life. And, and so this person walked out and so I'll just hold unforgiveness to get them. I'll get them. And so we have unforgiveness and then I'll just carry pride in my life and, and I'll just try to cover up things and I'll, I'll put on a good facade for everyone to see, but there's death on the inside of me. And we walk up on the grave of loss and on the grave of failure and of the pain that it creates in our life. And we cut people out of our life thinking that will fix it. And, and we cut God out of our life thinking that'll cover it up. And all we're doing is trying to cover up the stench of death in our life because we don't understand how to fix the core problem. 
And so we find ourselves on a merry-go-round of life, revisiting the same issues over and over again. The faces change and the names change and the situations change and it may be a new job and it may be a new school and it may be a new neighborhood and it may be a new marriage and it may be a new dating relationships, but the core issues continue to arise. We just think if we can throw some spices on them, that it'll fix it. And all it does is cover the stench of the death in our life. And the enemy of your soul is so good at causing the aroma of the dead places in your life to fill your nostril. And no matter how much you put spices on dead things, it doesn't make them live. Let me put it on the bottom shelf. You can put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. It's because we all have this core problem, all of us. No matter the color of your skin, no matter your financial portfolio, no matter your level of education or your lack of education, no matter how well networked you are, no matter your notoriety, or no matter if you feel like no one knows that you're even on the planet, we all have this core problem. No matter if you feel like you have moral high ground or you know you are a mess. We all have this core problem, and the problem, the Bible calls it sin. And that isn't meant to condemn you. It's the reality of all of humanity. I have this problem. You have this problem. And so we spend our life and we spend our wheels trying to fix this core problem, and the best we can do is cover it, but we can't correct it. Because sin brings death. Romans says this, the apostle Paul wrote, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, it entered through Adam and death through sin. And in this way, death came to, what's the last word? Everybody shout it. Come on, every campus. What? Yeah. Came to all people. Not some people. Not the really bad people. The reason that we think we're good is because we always compare ourselves to someone that's not as good as us. It's a dangerous game. All people, why? Because all sinned. Well, Pastor, I I don't think that I sinned, but I I mean, I make some mistakes. I'm not perfect. No, we're not mistakers who make mistakes. We are sinners who sin. Because some of your mistakes you planned. Is this too much on Easter Sunday? I'm trying to help you. Some of our mistakes we plan, well, when I get to the office, I'm gonna give them a piece of my mind. That wasn't a mistake, sir. It wasn't a mistake that you text her to let her know that you would be out of town on business and you could meet up in this city even though your wife was back at home. That's not a mistake. The Bible calls that sin. And no matter how much money you make, no matter how much relationship you have, no matter how successful you get, you cannot fix the sin problem. But I got really good news today on this Easter Sunday. The text says that when the women got to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away and they could not find the body in the grave. Here's what I wanna say to you. Before they ever got to the tomb, God was already working. And I just want you to know, before you ever got here, God was already working on your behalf. I don't know the conversations they had as they walked to the tomb that morning. I don't know the grief that was in their heart. I do know they did not expect a resurrection because if they had of, they would not have brought spices for a dead body. But I don't know the grief, I don't know the stories they told, I don't know the pain they were feeling, but what I do know is while they were walking, God was working. That while they were on their way to the tomb, that God was already at the tomb, moving the stone away, and the same spirit that lives on the inside of us as believers was raising Jesus out of the dead that day, making a way where there seemed to be no way. And I wanna say to you that before you were ever a thought in your mom and dad's mind, that God was already working, on your behalf, that the God of the universe, 
looked down through time and eternity and saw that you and I would have a problem that we could not solve called sin. And he knew that we would bring our own spices to the situation, trying to cover up the death and decay in our own life. And the God who was outside of time that saw you when you were born and when you would die at the same time, because he's not confined by time, he's outside of time. He knows the day that you came out of the womb. He knows the day that you have an appointment to meet him and stand before him in judgment. And because he knew you would have a problem you could not solve, he looked down through time and eternity and said, I'm not gonna let him live that way. And so he put in motion a plan whereby a baby would be put in the womb of a virgin named Mary. She would give birth to him. She would call him Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. He would walk the earth for 30 years, being tempted in every way that you and I are tempted, yet without sin because he was fully God, but he was fully man. In year 30, he would begin to heal the sick, raise the dead, open blinded eyes, open deaf ears, begin to give revelation of the kingdom of God. In his 33 year, he would walk into Jerusalem knowing that he was going to give his life on a cross for you and for me here today in 2022. He hung on the cross and on that cross, he declared, it is finished. That was a battle cry. The payment has been made. The battle has been won. Sin has been paid for. And they put him in a tomb, a borrowed tomb, because he wouldn't need it very long. And on the third day, the stone began to rattle and it rolled out of the way and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, got up from the dead, proving that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God with the power to take away my sin and your sin and the sin of the entire world. Because through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, so did death. And so all enter death because all have sinned. And we spend our life trying to cover up death. When Jesus made a way before you were ever working, before you were ever sinning, before you were ever on the planet, Jesus made a way. It's what Easter is all about. And so the angel says to these women, he said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And this is my question to you this Easter. Why do you keep expecting to find life in dead places? Why do you keep expecting to find life and joy and peace and hope and a brighter tomorrow? Why do you keep going to dead places? Places, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why do you keep returning to this? Why do you keep going back to the cycles of your life? You don't have to. Because Jesus was working before you ever got here. He was making a way for you where there seems to be no way. Well, pastor, I can't see God working in my life. I can't, I, my life has been filled with pain and tragedy and heartache. And I can't see where God is working. But could it be the events of your life are trying to point you to the light of Jesus? Could it be that your self-sufficiency haven't, hasn't got you anywhere? And maybe today's your day to surrender to the sufficiency of Christ in all things in your life. The Bible says that the women ran back and they told the 11 and the others. This is significant in the story of the resurrection that women took the message back. And the reason being is that in that culture, a woman's testimony was not admissible in court. So a woman couldn't testify to what she had seen in a case that was tried in court. But 
God uses women to be the first witnesses to testify of the resurrection. I think not only is God affirming women in this story, but it's also further validity to the resurrection. You may ask why, Pastor? Because there are some theories that say, well, the disciples stole the body, which would be kind of hard when there were two Roman guards there. The disciples stole the body and they fabricated this whole resurrection story. And so now we're following it 2,000 years and it's all a hoax. If that were the case, and they were trying to fabricate a believable story, what they should have done is said, one of the disciples, a man went to the tomb, saw the empty tomb and testified to everybody about it. But the gospel writers let it, left it just like it happened. That these women first heralded the gospel to the disciples. And the disciples weren't expecting the resurrection because they thought it was nonsense that the tomb was empty. And then Peter does what he does. And he says, I'm gonna go see for myself. And you know, that's my invitation to you today is why don't you see for yourself? Don't take my word for it. Don't take the word of thousands of people that have said yes to Jesus, see for yourself. Because God wants to do this great exchange with you today. He wants to give you a gift on this Easter that you could never earn, that you couldn't create, you couldn't purchase. He wants to give you something that in your own strength, your own ability, you could never have. And it's found in 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul wrote this, he said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. This is why the father turned his back on Jesus when he was on the cross and the sky went dark at noon because he couldn't look at all the sin he was carrying on the cross. So that in him being Jesus, we might become, look at this, the righteousness of God. You give God your sin, God gives you his righteousness. What an amazing gift. Well, don't I have to do some things, work for it? No, no, no. The Bible just says this. As scripture says, anyone who believes, there you go, believe in him being Jesus will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. In other words, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call in his name. For listen to this, for everyone, somebody shout everyone. everyone. Not, not just some group of people, not, not the ones that got it, not the ones that think their sin is a little less than the other ones. And, and no, everyone who does what? Who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I like the way the Psalm, Psalm said it in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, try it for yourself today. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Some people say, well, pastor, I, uh, or depending on where they're from, I grew up in Tennessee and there they would say, preacher. They say, well, when I get some things fixed in my life, then I'm gonna come to God. I just gotta get some things worked out first. I would say, here's the whole point, is you come just as you are. And then with the power of God, you can work some things out. And so I say today to you, come as you are. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of throwing perfume on dead things? Aren't you tired of looking for life in dead places? Isn't it exhausting? Then today I invite you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see if he isn't good. See if he won't forgive you. See if he won't give you hope. See if he won't lift the weight of sin off your life. See if he won't give you a better tomorrow, a brighter tomorrow, a home in heaven, a purpose now in the earth. See if he won't do it. 
And I wanna give you the opportunity to receive this free gift. How do you do it? The scripture told us you believe, believe that Jesus died, that he was buried and that God raised him from the dead. Believe the resurrection, that he is who he said he was, the son of God with the power to take away the sin of the world and call on him. And so in a moment, we're gonna call on him. I'm I'm gonna invite you to pray with me. No one's gonna come to you, embarrass you. I promise you, but we're gonna do that. And so in just a second, I just want you to know everything that's gonna happen. In just a second, I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And and then I'm gonna count to three. And when I get to three, if that's you, you'd say, I need a fresh start. I need a new beginning. I'm, I'm not asking you to join this church. I think it's a great one if you want to, wonderful. I'm not asking you to check some religious box. I'm asking you, do you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Not, not do you have religion, not do you have some Sunday school attendance. I've been confirmed. I've been, I'm not asking that. I'm asking, do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that heaven is your home? And if you don't, today's your day. That's why you're here. This is your moment. And so in just a moment, when we bow our heads and we close our eyes at every campus and even online, When I count to three, I'm gonna ask you to shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for me or your campus pastor to see. And then we're gonna pray together out loud. We do this every week as a church. No one's gonna be left out. No one's gonna be pointed out, I promise you. And this is your day. We believe God brought you here for this moment. So if you would bow your head, close your eyes at every location. No one looking around, ask that no one move in this moment. It's really a holy moment for many people. If you'd say, Pastor, God is speaking to me. I feel it, I know it, I know I don't have a relationship with him. I know I haven't taken that step. I need a new beginning, I need a fresh start on this Easter. Maybe you're here and you would even, if someone were to ask you, you're a Christian, you'd be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. But it's, it's a label, it's not a reality. And you would say, I know in my heart I'm far from God. You don't need me to tell you that today. If that's you, I believe that God brought you here to invite you into relationship, to sins forgiven, to a fresh start. And so in just a second, I'm gonna count to three. When I do, I just want you to shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for me or your campus pastor to see. Nobody looking around, we wouldn't embarrass you. It's between you and God, but if that's you, on three, this is your moment, you shoot it up right now. Here we go. One, two, three. You just shoot it up high enough, long enough. God bless you. God bless you, I see you all over the room. I see you in the very back. Incredible, incredible, you can put it down. Church, let's pray this out loud together for the benefit of those who just had the courage to shoot their hand up. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. Thank you for a brand new beginning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said a big amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision. Thanks for joining us for today's message. Feel free to rate, review, and share with a friend. If you'd like to find out how you can get involved or partner with us financially, visit lifepoint.org or download the LifePoint app. Thank you for your generosity.